Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Mandana very much for the opportunity to present in this case presentation conference today and over this weekend. I'm looking forward to some very interesting cases being presented. So my name is Keith Hunter. I am a professor of head and neck pathology at the University of Liverpool, working in the Liverpool Head and Neck Centre. Now, as a pathologist, I don't always see the need to justify my existence. But it's always very good to remind ourselves of the key role that pathologists do play in the care of patients. What they give to surgeons, oncologists and so on. And so we're going to have a look at that today and just see where we're going in terms of what a pathologist is going to offer and the key part, the central role that they play uh, for our patients. And many have said that pathologists are the uh, last resort of the socially inept. We hide away in cupboards, we're not part of the clinical team, uh, and therefore we are largely anonymous in many ways. But we know in practice that that's not true. We play a, a key part in the clinical care of our patients in the uh, data and the advice that we give to our surgical and oncological colleagues so that they can care for the patients. And there's a richness to that data, which is only increasing and that uh, reinforces the importance of our role. So what about looking at oral cancer, for an example? And we could have looked at salivary gland, we could have looked at odontogenic tumours, but today we're going to have a look at oral cancer and what the pathologist contributes to the care of the oral cancer patient. So here is a patient, obviously, who has a malignancy on the lateral border of the tongue. So what does the pathologist contribute to this care? Well, there are elements of pretreatment in the, in the diagnostic phase, then there are maybe some elements during the treatment, the surgical treatment, and then post-treatment after the surgical treatment uh, and the discussions at the multidisciplinary team. So in the pre-treatment and the diagnostic phase of this, well, then there are elements related to the incisional biopsy. And you know, I think we, as pathologists, we know what constitutes a good biopsy, and it's useful at times to remind our surgical colleagues of exactly what that is. But in terms of what we're contributing from the biopsy, we know that we're going to hopefully be able to give a diagnosis. If the biopsy is sufficient size, we might be able to give an indication of the grade of the tumour. And if we can see the invasive front, depth and pattern of invasion and any other useful prognostic features that might dictate what the treatment might be planned for a particular patient. And then during treatment, particularly during surgical treatment, uh, there is the element of the use of frozen section, particularly for the control of margins and, and looking at the completeness of excision. Now, we do not really do this very much, uh, certainly in my own practice, uh, but it is used in some centres quite widely. It does have a, its drawbacks and it will prolong the operation. The patient is anaesthetised while this is ongoing and it is expensive and time consuming in terms of the availability of pathologists. But most importantly, it's not really convincingly been shown to increase patient survival uh, or prognosis from a cancer, but in some institutions it is widely used. But here's our surgical resection specimen. It has a segmental mandibulectomy, and you can see teeth you can also see a hemiglossectomy associated with that, and put in the neck dissection, which is attached at the bottom of the specimen. You think, well, where do you start with something like this? Is there any help? Is there any guidance? Well, we all have had our teachers that have helped us understand the anatomy of these specimens and, and be able to trim them. But there are some helpful documents. And again, I'm going to go to the College of Pathologists documents, as I'll refer to on many occasions during the talk. And there is one of these called the Tissue Pathways for Head and Neck Pathology, and that gives overall guidance much wider than for oral cancer specimens in terms of appropriate cut up and block selection and so on, that we might maximize the amount of information that we're getting from the specimens. So here again, we have our excision specimen and we've got marked on here, perhaps where we would take our blocks from it. If it's a small specimen, you might want to block it all. And you can then take uh, the blocks, as you can see here, looking at uh, the extent of the tumor, how close to the margin it is and making sure that you have a wide sampling of the whole of the surgical specimen so that you can give a complete answer in your pathology report. So when it comes to then assessing the slides, what does the pathologist add to this? And, and I've put this really through these six main areas, and we're just going to step through these one by one. The starting point, I guess, to some extent, is the cancer itself, 
uh, and we see the definitions and the description of the various subtypes in the WHO classification, uh, and they can be useful to help us in that. But the vast majority of these are going to be conventional oral squamous cell carcinomas. And we look at them and we grade them as in well differentiated, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated. Uh, the amount of keratinization and some other features taken into account in terms of defining the grade. The vast majority of them, certainly in my own practice, would be moderately differentiated. Overall, I suppose we are applying the grading scheme which was introduced many, many years ago by Broder, and the, the basics of that um, classification are still used in the, in the uh, 2017 WHO classification. There always has been some suggestion, but how useful is that? Does, does it really predict particularly well how these patients are going to do, what the prognosis is going to be? And so there have been a lot of different attempts over the years to integrate a lot, our far larger body of data into this assessment of grading and prediction of the clinical course for these patients. Um, looking at elements of the tumor cells and the microenvironment, and then the modifications by Anneroth and Burnham and overall into histological risk score, which is Margie Brandwine's scheme, uh, and the rather complex um, worst pattern of invasion assessment, which is used widely in other areas of pathology, such as in skin pathology. And if you're interested, there's a paper which looks at all of these grading systems. It's from Journal of Oral Pathology and Medicine in uh, 2012. We then want to look at the subtype. If it's not conventional, what are the other subtypes? And very briefly to go through these, there are the Baruchus lesions, largely exophytic lesions with very minimal atypia. Whereas in comparison to that, the basaloid ones, which are relatively rare in the oral cavity, are, are histologically high grade and tend to have a lot of necrosis. Papillary squamous cell carcinoma, which we really see very rarely in the oral cavity, um, is quite variable in its presentation and very often is exophytic and gingiva, as you can see in the example. Other types that we see from time to time, spindle cell or sarcomatoid, which is much more common in the larynx than in the oral cavity, and are a particular problem in patients who have had previous irradiation, so perhaps in the context of a recurrence. And the immunohistochemistry quite often is helpful, the cytokeratin and environmental positivity, but on occasion, maybe cytokeratin negative, which is particularly challenging. Other types, um, acantholytic type, previously known as adenoid squamous cell carcinoma, it's acantholysis producing duct-like areas in the tumour. And then adenosquamous carcinoma, which is distinct from that, where there is a squamous carcinoma component and an adenocarcinoma component both needing to be present and you see mucin and other features associated with that. So once we've established the diagnosis, well they need to look at other features and one of the main things that the surgeons are going to want to know is what about the extent of local spread and that does dictate I guess to some extent the T stage of TNM. So you're looking at the extent and, and where the tumour extends into, for example, in this case, which is a, a floor of mouth tumour, you can see that uh, the deep extent is extending into the muscle of the myelohyoid. It's extending round towards the submandibular gland, maybe uh, invading into the superficial part of that. One of the things which is very important is the potential for spread into bone. And you can see in the image here that this tumour is extending widely into bone through the periodontal ligament which is a very common route of entry of squamous carcinoma into the jaws. If it's a dentalist patient, it may well be through fenestrations. And whilst we have an example like this and it's straightforward, if the invasion is much more superficial or erosive rather than invasion, it can be challenging. And we've been doing some work in Sheffield uh, with Ali Karam has been leading that, looking at bone invasion and how we might define that uh, more clearly. In terms of assessing the bone, when you get the specimen, you do need to make sure that you take uh, appropriate samples of the bone. Very helpful to have a saw for that. Uh, and you take uh, the, the margins and obviously then representative sections from the middle to try and look at the extent of tumour within the bone of the jaws. Following on from that, depth and pattern of invasion. Um, in the case of looking at the depth of invasion, uh, that uh, you can see in the case here, three and a half millimetres from the surface, um, a bit more difficult if you've got either ulcerated or even an exophytic lesion, but it does relate to prognosis. And if the depth of invasion is greater than five millimeters, that has a worse prognosis, and that's largely because it is associated with an increased risk of lymph node metastasis. <laughs> 
Similarly, there is a relationship between prognosis and the pattern of invasion. And this diagram here, which is um, from one of the new WHO, sorry, rather one of the new RC PATH data sets, uh, which will sh hopefully shortly be published, you can see the uh, examples of the different patterns of invasion with cohesive pattern being associated with a better prognosis and the various non-cohesive patterns associated with poorer prognosis. Other features which we're looking for include involvement of nerves, perineural invasion, which tends to be associated with local recurrence, and invasion into vessels, which is related to metastasis. One other feature that surgeons and oncologists are very uh, keen to know is, well, what is the marginal status? Has this been removed? And are they close or whatever? And you know, we, we do that very carefully in terms of looking at both mucosal and soft tissue margins. Talk about soft tissue, I mean the deep margin, but also the peripheral soft tissue margin. And in general, for the oral cavity, we use the figures as you can see in the slide in terms of greater than five millimeter, we retain that clear margin, and others are close or involved margins. Um, some people like to, to use the residual tumor, the R status, that's um, outlined in the TNM classification. Uh, we don't tend to use it very much, certainly in my own practice, but in other areas, for example, in Europe, it is quite widely used. And then you can bring that data together, and sometimes it's useful to use the photographs of the specimen just to mark out where you took the blocks, but also to be able to superimpose upon that the marginal status. And this is useful just to clarify in your own mind where the close margins are, but it can also be very useful in transmitting that information to the surgeon uh, and to the oncologist that might define where they're going to take more uh, tissue or particularly uh, help in the planning of radiotherapy or so on. So you think, well, that's a lot of things to remember. In fact, what I've got on the screen here now is what we call the core data from our Royal College of Pathologist data sets. And it's a long list, it's a full list of important features. And the thing to notice that although the list is long, it's not just our preference or our thoughts on that. This is evidence-based practice. The incorporation of all of these features uh, is graded in our data sets and uh, according to the uh, pattern outlined by the SIGN Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network for grading the level of evidence for these things. And, you know, in terms of it, not everything is, is relevant to every circumstance. For example, grade we know does not relate to, it's not used in oropharynx cancer. Ancillary studies um, in the oral cavity, testing for HPV is not really worthwhile um, in most cases, whereas in the oropharynx it's essentially mandatory for all of the tumours. And uh, whilst we're using TNM8 largely, there are some circumstances in which TNM7 is appropriate, for example, in clinical trials. But it is a large body of information which the incorporation of that into your report is based on good evidence. What about the neck? The neck lumps are common. And of course, we need to be aware of the surgical anatomy of the head and neck as well. And again, just as for the primary lesion, there is an element in which the pathologist can be involved in the pre-treatment or the diagnostic phase, maybe involved in the fine needle aspirate cytology. Some of you may do actually do that on the clinic. And also, uh, needle core biopsy, which tends to be my own usual practice, and that is greatly aided by the help of a friendly radiologist and um, ultrasound guidance. In terms of the post-treatment after the surgery, well, here we have a couple of specimens tend to get them pinned out in cork in some places. In Sheffield, for example, we used to get the levels separated by the surgeons in theatre. It doesn't matter, you need to be aware of what the local practice is. And in some cases, as in the, the specimen on the left-hand side here, the, the main resection specimen is also attached. And again, you can apply the, the advice and the guidance, which is in the tissue uh, pathways document to help in that. And histologically, we're looking for metastatic tumour in the lymph node. When it's like this one, it's very obvious. Much smaller metastases can be much more subtle within the subcapsular sinus. Uh, and can be very difficult to define in times. Extranodal extension is another very important feature that we're looking for. And you can see in this case that the islands of tumour are extending out of the node into the surrounding tissue. And that is a particularly poor prognostic feature and is also related to the size of the lymph node. The larger it is, the greater the risk you're going to have extranodal extension. 
and that is a very poor prognostic feature. And again, you can bring together all of that information. Specimen photography can be very helpful in this regard in terms of defining where you know, find the nodes, where the positive nodes are, where the extranodal extension are, uh, is. And uh, again, it can be useful for defining further surgery or helping in the planning of oncological therapy for these patients. So bringing that all together, there's a whole list of features that I've talked about as being core data items that the pathologist is going to bring together. We say, well, how do I remember all that? It's a huge list. Well, this is something that I've alluded to on the way through my presentation. There are standards and data sets for reporting cancers. Now, here I present to you um, the uh, current um, oral cavity data set. The revised version is with the College of Pathologists at the moment uh, for assessment. Uh, and this outlines all of these core data items, but also presents them in a pro forma. So you can use that pro forma either as someone just to aid your memory when you're reporting or actually formally use it as a pro forma, which can then be given to your surgical team or to the MDT. And this means that if you use that structure, you will then be less likely to forget any of these important pieces of data. And it can be very helpful uh, moving forward. And so just the, a couple of web links for the College of Pathologist data sets. Um, you'll find there that there are new data sets from the head and neck set appearing as we go through the revision process. And also the International Cancer Collaborative uh, for Reporting, um, which has data sets and head and neck as well. And they're about to come up for the, their first set of revision and the web link is there for them. But that's kind of where we are, and maybe that has been very familiar to you. But where are we going? Is there going to be changes coming? And I suggest to you that there are, because there are a number of important things. We saw that in the TNM8 classification, that there were perhaps the most uh, dramatic changes in the TNM and head and neck we've seen for any of the recent iterations, and much of them around uh, the assessment of oropharynx cancers. Molecular diagnostics are becoming increasingly important. Here's an example of an oropharynx cancer with P16 immunohistic chemistry at the bottom and DNA in situ hybridization in the top panel. This is going to become more and more needful as we go on. We have now come into the age of immunotherapy and the, uh, the biomarkers that are associated with that. Um, and so there are going to be new things that we are going to have to provide to treatment providers in relation to that. And then surgical practice is changing as well with the increase in transoral robotic and transoral laser um, surgery. And these provide slightly different specimens with different challenges. So what about the future? Well, we know that, for example, that there are some molecular markers that are uh, just about in use. We, we use P16 and some HPV specific tests in our oropharynx lesions. We are now starting to look at the assessment of pd one expression uh, as patients increasingly get put into immunotherapy regimens. Um, and the data sets will mean that they will, they will complexify over the period. And there are other things which I just want to talk about briefly, which we have suggested in the current revisions of the College of Pathologist data sets might also be rich seams of data that the pathologists can provide, which may be helpful. And now these are related to some extent to the biology of head and neck cancer and the HPV story is well known and in relation to that and that is currently where we do provide a lot of data for P16 expression and, and HPV uh, in these tumours. A lot of the other biological features in terms of the tumour and some of these markers have never really found their way through to diagnostics. But there are some elements that I think would be very useful that again can be taken just from uh, very straightforward assessment of the tissue. And much of these relate to the tumour microenvironment. Um, the supporting cells, particularly fibroblasts, cancer-associated fibroblasts, as assessed by smooth muscle actin uh, expression, have been very useful in de defining the prognosis in oral cancer patients. And those who have a high expression of cancer-associated fibroblasts uh, tend to do much worse. Similarly, elements of the immune microenvironment, those who have uh, lots of tumour infiltrating lymphocytes tend to do better than those who are 
to low have a very few tumour infiltrating lymphocytes. And to some extent that overlaps with elements of looking at pd one expression and relates to uh, the patient's sensitivity to immunotherapy. So does the pathologist still have a role? They say that every dog has its day. Has the pathologist had its day? And we're coming into the era of the biologist and we really don't need pathology and the morphology and the skills that we have. Well, I very much put to you that the pathologist is not one of these dogs that's had its day. We still very much have a role to play in the care of our patients. So thank you very much for this opportunity to present this today. Um, I'm very grateful to a number of people who have influenced me over my careers. Many of them are shown below. Um, and I'd be very happy uh, when we come to the uh, panel discussion, uh, take any questions in relation to this presentation. Thank you.